7 o'clock, so just an item of housekeeping. There is chocolate cake and white cake left from Tom and Lisa's birthday party. So if you get a piece, make sure you thank Lisa for being born and uh, for sharing her cake. As I understand, there's candy, there's peanut butter fudge, and there are donuts. And we expect all of that to be eaten before you guys leave. I also understand there's a group after Bible study that's going to go across the street to Janet Aker's house and see what candy she has left. And that you guys are dressed as Bible study attendees. So, if you are interested in joining that, talk with Mike. So, <laughs> so before we get into Bible study, let's begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for Martin Luther's Reformation, which is one of the reasons that we are able to be here as Protestants, as Presbyterians, studying your word for ourselves. Lord, uh, as always, we ask that you be a part of this Bible study. Send your Holy Spirit, Lord, to give us wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Open our eyes and our ears, our hearts and our minds we may receive all that you have to give tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we have come tonight to another one of those milestone chapters in salvation history. We're going to see here the final rejection of Saul as king. And then in the very next chapter, God is going to send Samuel to anoint the replacement. And the replacement is going to be the man after God's own heart, David, the shepherd boy. And of course, with David being established as the head of the royal line, eventually from him comes the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Exactly. So this truly is a momentous a uh, couple of chapters that we're going to be looking at. The rest of First Samuel, after tonight, is going to be the story, essentially, of Saul, who will not let go, versus David, the one who should be on the throne. So, God's going to continue to reject Saul more and more. He's going to get worse and worse, more and more paranoid more and more uh, tyrant as king. Um, he's going to try to foil God's plans by killing David. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves, let's read chapter 15. Let's see what leads to Saul's rejection. And who would like to read this? Thank you, Anne. Appreciate it. And Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now, therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek, Amalek. I read through this and practiced these. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I brought I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devout and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So Samuel summoned the people and numbered them in Tereum, 200,000 on foot and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, Go depart, go down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the people of Israel when you came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites, and Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites alive and devoted 
to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agog and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatted calves and the lambs and all that was good that would not utterly and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless they devoted to destruction. The word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry, and he cried to the Lord all night. And Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, and it was Samuel that told Saul, Saul I'm sorry, and it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself, and turned and passed on and went down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears? and the lowing of the oxen that I hear. Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have devoted to destruction. Then Samuel said to Saul, stop, I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, speak. And Samuel said, Though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go, devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are all consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agog, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may bow before the Lord. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. As Samuel turned to go away, Saul seized the skirt of his robe and tore it. And Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day, and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have, have regret. Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel and return with me that I may bow down before the Lord your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul bowed before the Lord. Then Samuel said, Bring here to me Agog, the king of the Amalekites. And Agog came to him cheerfully. 
Agog said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, As your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agog to pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went to, up to his house in Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel did not see Saul again until the day oops, too many pages. <laughs> until the day of his death. But Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Okay. A lot going on in that chapter. Not one of the Old Testament stories that we generally teach in Sunday school. I bet it's not part of your curriculum for the first through third, although they might like it. I don't know. They might, they might be really interested. Um, but remember, this is strike three for Saul. Last week, we saw strike one and strike two. So this is not the Lord saying, well, you made one mistake, and that's it, we're done. This is Saul showing a repeat pattern of disregarding what the Lord has to say and showing the state of his heart. Keep that in mind, because that's going to be important in the next chapter. Before we get into these events here, we first have to talk about the Amalekites. Who were the Amalekites? They were a nomadic group of people. They didn't necessarily have settled cities. They were Bedouin people, as we would say today. They lived in the, the desert south of Judah, around the, the Aqaba area, and they also lived in the Sinai Peninsula. They were descendants of Jacob's twin brother, Esau. So these are cousins in a way. In Exodus chapter 17, so right after the slaves left Egypt, right after the ten plagues, the parting of the Red Sea is Exodus 14 and 15. Three months later, they make it to Mount Sinai in Exodus 18 and 19. So in that in-between period, in the first months that the Israelites have left Egypt and are in the desert, they haven't really even been formed as a nation yet. They're still making that transition from being former slaves to becoming the people of the Lord. They haven't even gotten the Ten Commandments yet. They haven't built the tabernacle. They're brand new. The Amalekites attacked them and tried to get rid of them. So when Israel was at its weakest, the Amalekites attacked. And remember, they're attacking God's chosen people, the ones that God had chosen to fulfill that covenant promise that he gave to Abraham, and then to Isaac, and then to Jacob, and then to Joseph, that through them, and through their descendants, the whole world would be blessed, and the Savior of the world would come. So at this point in history, when you attack Israel, especially when you attack them at their weakest, you are attacking God, and God's plans to save the world. This is evil, and the way they did it was also evil. In Deuteronomy 25, the Lord names the real, the worst part of what the Amalekites did is when they attacked the Israelites, they didn't attack the, the soldiers, if they even had soldiers. They didn't attack the ones that went out front to fight. They attacked the stragglers, they attacked the elderly, they attacked the children. They attacked the sick, the weakest people, the handicapped. Those are the ones that the Amalekites went after. They were a nasty, nasty, violent people. And the Lord declared that he was going to wipe them out in judgment. 
That was 400 <coughs> years before this. God patiently waited 400 years, giving them 400 years to repent. And they didn't. We know from Old Testament history, we know from the book of Jonah especially, God declared Nineveh is going to be wiped out. Jonah went and preached a seven-word <coughs> sermon, hoping that they wouldn't repent. And they did. And God said, not going to wipe them out because they repented before me. The Amalekites did not. And so after 400 years, God says, Saul, now that you're king, I have a job for you. You are going to be the instrument of my judgment, and I want all of Amalek to be wiped out completely. This is called, the people were under the ban. It happened only a few times in Old Testament history, and all that was allowed to survive were metal implements. Everything else had to be destroyed. And in the Old Testament, God only declared this holy war a few times. It was always people who were um, occupying part of the promised land. So God never sent them against the Egyptians. God never sent them against the people of Damascus. It was always people within God's chosen promised land. And they were always people who were trying to attack Israel. These are people that are trying to wipe out what God is trying to do. And this is a fragile time. And so God says, because these people are so reprehensible and violent, and we know the patience of God, we know the compassion of God, God is not somebody that says, you know what, you said a bad word, so we're going to completely wipe out you and your entire family. This ha he waits patiently until evil reaches incredibly reprehensible levels. We know from the Amalekites, they practiced their religion through child sacrifice. They literally sacrificed their children on the altar. They had, they, they, Horrible practices. We're not going to go deep into that. But trust me, truly disgusting, violent, horrible society. And God says no more. The problem, however, is it was not popular as a soldier to carry out this kind of warfare. Because what's the number one reason that you become a soldier at this time? Huh? Defense. Defense, yeah. Get the goods. Spoils of war. Oh, right. Yeah, you're defending your people, patriotism, etc., etc., but you get to gather up the goodies from the losing side. There are none because it's all destroyed and wiped out. They did this in Jericho, that, that was put under the ban. The city of Ai next was put under the ban, and a man named Achan didn't like that. He took some of the spoils of the war, and it caused a national crisis because God said, oh, no, 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 no. You are not going to be using this rare judgment as a way to get rich. That's not what this is about. So... God's told, tell Saul, here's your job. Saul summons his army, 210,000 people, and he heads south towards the Amalekites. First, we've got another group of people, the Kenites, that also live in this area. They have to be gotten out of the way. They were kind to the Israelites when they came out of Egypt. Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, was a Kenite. So we find Saul being very careful. This is not just, hey, go kill whoever you find. We have to move the Kenites out of the way. And then they attack 
And they defeat the Amalekites from Havilah to Shur. Shur is in Egypt. But they don't follow what the Lord has said. Number one, they spare Agag or Agag, the king. We're not entirely told why. Maybe Saul wants to lord it over the king. Maybe he wants to have a victory parade and put him in chains. Maybe, I don't know, but he does not um, execute the king of the Amalekites. He spares him. And what else does he spare? The best of the best. Best, the fattest, healthiest livestock, all that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. But the best of the spoils, they did not. Is this what God told them to do? No. Well, he wanted the animals all killed too. Everything. 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 Yeah. So there'd be nothing left of that civilization. So we have here, again, Saul disobeying what the Lord has to say. And before Samuel can even go, the Lord speaks. <coughs> and this is some of the scariest words that you can hear God say. I regret that I have made Saul king. The last time, in my, to my knowledge, we see God saying something like this, he said it to Moses at one point, I regret that I brought these people out of Egypt. He also says to Noah, I regret that I have made these people. And at that point, we're told that humanity's thoughts were only evil all the time. You can think of that. So we have this level here of God in an anthropomorphic way regretting what he has done, just like he told the Israelites would happen, right? I'll give you a king, but I don't think this is a good idea. So we have here. What did the people want? They wanted a king just like all the other nations had, and they get a king just like all the other nations had, a godless leader who does not obey. The key words here are going to be disobedience and rebellion. Saul is rebelling against the Lord. And Samuel is, is grieved by this, He's angry. He has one of those all-night prayer sessions that some of you may be familiar with, where he cries out to the Lord and prays all night. Because remember, he's essentially adopted Saul as his son. And now God's rejecting him and saying, he's not going to be king anymore. Last week we saw he'd already said he's not going to pass on a dynasty. Now we're done with him altogether. To make matters worse, as Samuel is traveling to Saul's camp, what does he find out Saul is doing? He's holding a cup. Right? Before that, verse 12, what's he doing? We made a monument to himself. No. <laughs> he made a monument to himself. What more do we need to see here about his character? Was this about Saul being a great king and a great military general? Was this about Saul showing his power? No, this was about Saul bowing before the true king of Israel who is making a legitimate judgment against a wicked people that God says, these people belong to me and I say they are to be no more. Only God has the right to make that judgment because we all belong to him, right? And when he says your days are done, your days are done. 
And here he says to Israel, you're going to make that happen. It's rare, it's unusual, but God has the right to do this. Saul is making this all about himself. And what's even worse is when Samuel arrives, Saul says, God bless you, I've done everything the Lord told me to do. <laughs> Have you? Have you really? And here we see, I mean, this is dark humor, verse 14. Samuel's like, what is this bleeding of sheep that I hear? What is this lowing of oxen that I hear? You've done everything the Lord said? Uh-huh. <coughs> of course you have. It's like, Mom, coming home, I told you to clean the house. I cleaned the house. Well, why is there dust on the table? Why is there lint all over the floor? Why is there dirt all over the kitchen floor? Well, you just saw the book. <laughs> I did most of it, you know. I, I, I did what I thought was decent to do. I did what I wanted, you know. So. But Joshua, at no time did Saul refer to the Lord as his Lord. Exactly. Right. If or you didn't Alan hear, Karen said, uh, at no point does Saul refer to the Lord as his Lord. It's always the Lord your God. That's a very important point, yeah. At one point he says the Lord and just leaves it. But yeah, exactly. That, that tells you everything again right there. He's not submitting to the true king of Israel. He's serving at God's uh, pleasure and he's not pleasing God. So we've got this biting humor. Samuel rebukes him. And does Saul repent? Well, he blames everybody else. else. He blames Saul that it's not his fault. It's the not my fault. The people it. wanted that. It wasn't on me. Well, and then he lies. He's like, we're going we're gonna to give this up as an offering to the Lord. No, he wasn't. Right. Yeah. Well, in 24, he says, I've sinned for I've transgressed the commandment of the Lord. Hold on to that thought. We'll get to 24. Yeah. He does eventually get there. But first, verse 15, well, the people, the people spared the best. Who's in charge of the people? <laughs> Who's the king? Well, but, but, but the people, the people wanted to do this. And, and we, we're going to do this to sacrifice to the Lord your God. Here's Saul's biggest failure and what separates him from David. Whenever Saul is confronted with his sins, there's always some lame excuse. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. And then we have this same twisted logic that we had before. Well, we were going to honor the Lord with these animals. We're going to honor the Lord by disobeying the Lord's commandment. Mm -hmm. Not a good idea. Yeah. And when we sacrifice all of these choice fat animals, the best of the sheep, the best of the oxen, keep in mind, you only burn a portion of that animal. The rest you get to feast on. So he's just described that he's like Hophni and Phinehas at the beginning. It's all about me getting a really good meal to eat out of this. We're going to honor the Lord. Totally. The Lord's going to get the first bite. <laughs> but the rest of the roast is for us, and we're going to feast on that. Yeah. Karen. Um, I, I still have a problem with Saul. Everybody has a problem with Saul. <laughs> In the beginning, Saul didn't know the Lord. Holy Spirit came upon him. But it doesn't say anything other than Samuel took him on as his own son. But it, I guess I want him to go to Bible study. <laughs> <laughs> it, it doesn't seem to have fallen on his heart, if right. you will, to follow the Lord or how to follow the Lord. Right. It, I, I, whether, we're talking about Saul's heart here, and we're not told, like you, you're asking, what kind of instruction he got. I'm assuming 
that Samuel gave instruction, he remember he wrote down what the king was supposed to do uh, and gave it to him. But what, he, yeah, keep in mind the state of his heart. That's going to be important when we get to chapter 16. Yes. Well, it's not as though Samuel did such an aces job with his own children. Well, there's that, yeah. So. Yeah. But we had some promise at the beginning with Saul. We did. But the longer Saul is king, the worse he becomes. So I, I'm, I would read into it. Power corrupts. <clears throat> and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Yeah. This just so much reminds me of the chapter that I just finished in our story of, um, uh, by Joanna Weaver about heaven and Mary's spirit. She did a chapter on pride. Yeah. And Saul's pride, he put himself above God. Yep. And I can do whatever I want because I'm the king. I'm the king. I'm the king. Yeah. And that's, it's like, oh. I don't yeah. Know. And, and I mean, how many of these stories do we have where pride goes before the fall? Yeah. But Joshua, it, it goes back to you wanted a king. Uh-huh. And they wrote out what's wrong with having a king. Here's what's wrong with having a king. <laughs> and he followed that way yeah. rather than the Lord's way. Yeah. And he's confronted here over and over again. Um... And he still cannot really repent. We, we, Samuel says, stop. Let me tell you what God said. And we basically have here, beginning at verse 17, you were nobody. You were in the least important and least populous of the 12 tribes. And you weren't even a big fish in that little pond. You know, you were a nobody. And I took you and I made you king over Israel. I gave you everything. I made you the, how, the head of the tribes of Israel. I anointed you king. I sent you on a mission. I gave you a simple mission. And you did not obey me who gave you everything. Instead, you pounced on the plunder and the spoil and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, which is exactly what Saul complained that the people were doing last week, right? When they weren't allowed to eat, mm -hmm. and so then they pounced on the plunder and began to eat the food before draining the blood out of it. And he's like, oh, these people, all they care about is plunder and spoil, and they're not doing it right. Well, what are we doing now? under Saul's leadership. And still, he doesn't repent. He said, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I went on the mission the Lord sent me on. Here's the king that I brought back. Yeah, the one God told you to execute. <laughs> yeah. and, but, 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 but the people took the spoil, the sheep and the oxen and the best of the things, to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal, and here's the big lesson. To obey is better than sacrifice. Obeying the Lord is better than the ritual. To obey is better than dropping the big check in the plate. Is it bad to drop the big check in the plate? No, Christine and Rita get very excited when you drop a big check in the plate when they're counting the offering. They're very in a really good mood the rest of that Wednesday morning after counting the offering. But if you go out and make a whole bunch of money putting, being a, an assassin for the mob and then write a big check to drop it in the plate, is God happy? If you go down to the boat and gamble and make hundreds of thousands of dollars and then write a big check and drop it in the plate, is the Lord happy? No. To obey is better than sacrifice. Rebellion, this was one that my grandmother quoted at us a lot. Rebellion is as the sin of divination. She used the old language. Rebellion is nigh unto witchcraft. 
haven't done witchcraft, Grandma. I haven't done anything. But rebelling against God is just as bad as divination or witchcraft, because both are turning away from the Lord and rejecting his word and doing your own thing instead. And so since you have rejected the word of the Lord over and over and over again, because God is patient, nevertheless, now he has rejected you from being king. And finally, finally, too little too late, Linda pointed this out, Verse 24, we finally got him to say, I have sinned, and here's another of the deep failings, because I feared the people more than I feared the Lord. I feared public opinion and what people are going to say about me. Yes. He's admitting why he did it. He's admitting, and yet... Because that's but not being accepted, I'm saying it's their fault. He's, he's saying it's their fault, and and because Samuel and the Lord don't accept this, I'm reading this. He's very sorry he got caught. Yeah. He's not at all sorry that he did it. The soul was the one who said that he wasn't forgiven. It really didn't give God the chance to say that. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin, and here's why I interpret it, and return with me that I may go up in front of everybody and show lead, that and okay. show that I'm okay with the Lord. And Samuel said, I will not. I will not be your puppet. Um, that's how the commentaries I read, it turned, why that, that, so-called repentance was not accepted because he put on there not I have sinned and let the Lord do what he may but I've said now will you please go with me so we can get up in front of everybody and show that I'm still great and wonderful yeah Joshua who the sacrifice who made the sacrifice I thought it had to be a priest who made the sacrifice yeah they, they're, they're, they're setting all these animals aside for the priest to do that also they have not sacrifice that's why they're still bleeding and mooing and <laughs> lowing and carrying on. Thank you. Yeah. Good when question. Did, when did it get get fall away from being having the, the Levites, the priests? With the destruction of the temple. Um, because then you didn't need sacrifices anymore. Is, is this after that? No, this is way we haven't even built the temple yet. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the high priest didn't do sacrifice? No, they had the tabernacle. But it was a movable tent. They hadn't built the temple yet. So, yeah. This is about 1,050 years before Christ. Yeah. So, we have a rejection. As Samuel turns to go away, Saul desperately grabs onto his hem and tears it, and I mean, this is savage here. Now the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. Ouch. I mean, you can't really get more plain than that. And the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret. He's not going to change his mind on this one. Um, and it's even more symbolic because at the hem, as some of you may remember, are the tassels that are to be sewn onto the hem of a Jewish man's garment, symbolizing the devotion to the word of the Lord. You'll see that on Jewish prayer shawls. There's always tassels on the end, and sometimes when they're, a Jewish person is praying, they'll spin the tassels. I don't know why, but they do. Um, so he's tearing away the symbol of the word of the Lord. And God says, I have torn the kingdom away from you. And even now he doesn't get it. I have sinned, but please, please come back with me 
and help me to save face before the elders of Israel. Honor me now, honor me, honor me. It's all about me. And return with me that I may bow before the Lord your God. Your God. And Samuel finally, finally does that because this is the last time he's going to see Saul. But there's still one more person left. There's still King Agag, King Agag. And he's feeling pretty good because I haven't died yet. <laughs> so I just may well make it. And again, Samuel is savage here. As you have made, as your sword has made women childless, so your mother will be childless among women. I mean, live by the sword, die by the sword. Yeah. He was saying that to Agag's mother? About well, Agag's about mother. his mother, yeah. Yeah. And then. Uh, well, don't you think she would have been done having children by then? Oh, she's always been. But yeah, she's always his mother. So, I mean, he's just making it more personal in this sense. You, you have bereaved so many women by your violence. Now the women of your family will be bereaved by violence against you. And then Samuel goes back to Ramah, and Saul goes back to Gibeah. And what's even more poignant is Ramah and Gibeah are two miles apart. And Samuel never saw Saul again. <clears throat> now, why is this such a big deal? Number one, when Saul dies, spoiler alert, Saul is no longer alive today. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when Saul dies at the end of 1 Samuel, guess who is the one that kills him? An Amalekite. Oh. I, I thought they were all dead. No, oh, he didn't finish he didn't the job. Right. He, did. oh he didn't goodness. finish the job. There are some that make it. If he had done what God had called him to do, things would have been different. Later, King David is still going to have to fight the Amalekites. And much, much later, 600 years from this point, when the Persian Empire is in charge and King Xerxes goes looking for a new wife and has that beauty pageant that eventually he chooses a woman that is Jewish that he does not know is Jewish and her name is Esther. Esther. At that time, the number two man in the Persian kingdom, the Hitler of his day, is a man named Haman the Agagite the descendant of Amalekite King Agag, and he wants to destroy the Jews. Hmm, I wonder why. Because his people have hated the Jewish people for 600 years plus. Well, a thousand years by that point. If Saul had done his job, how different would history have been? We wouldn't have had all of that trouble centuries down the line in the time of Esther and Mordecai. So when God says, even if it seems, Lord, this, this, I don't understand this. How could you ask me to do this? He knows what he's doing, right? So a difficult chapter. It's not a fun chapter. I don't know that anybody's going to stitch any of these verses on a pillow. Um, you know, I, I, I pick maybe verse 33, as your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag to pieces before the Lord. Um, but, I don't know. But it's a lot to put on a pillow. So make that your tagline on your email. It shows up every time you. <laughs> Questions? I know this is a difficult chapter, but thoughts? I just wonder why so many Jewish men were named Saul. Was there a good Saul? Let's do that on this. Well, the two Sauls in the Bible. Paul. Paul. 
Yeah, Saul becomes Paul. He is not good when he's Saul. Um, sometimes Saul is short for Solomon. But he wasn't all that great either, so I don't know. I'd maybe pick David or Isaac or Moses. I don't, I have no, I, I don't understand the question. No, you were saying that they go after the children after the week, after the week. Uh, yeah, sadly, that practice hasn't gone away. Yeah. All right, who would like to read chapter 16? Mike, thank you very much. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to, to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peace peaceably? And he said, Peaceably I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all of your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Now the spirit of the Lord depart, departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's servants said to him, Behold now, a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when the harmful spirit from God is upon you, he will play it, and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, Provide for me a man who can play well and bring him to me. One of the young men answered, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite, who was skillful in playing, in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me David your son, who is with the sheep. Jesse took a donkey laden with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat and sent them by David his son to Saul. And David came to Saul and entered his service. And Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David remain in my service, for he has found favor in my sight. And whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. Okay, that's where we're going to stop for today. 
So the key words in the beginning of this chapter, this, this first section here, the key words repeated over and over again are words reflecting the word see. Samuel goes to see, to look for the new king. But he doesn't see the way the Lord sees. And we have this play on the words for see and look and observe and eyes over and over again as God is revealing to Samuel what he's not able to see himself. The reason I care about this much is because my senior year of seminary, I had to take my Presbyterian ordination exams. And one of them is Hebrew or Greek uh, exegesis, which is interpreting, and I had to write on this passage. Oh. <laughs> so I had to translate it and come up with outlines and a sermon outline and all of this, and yeah. And I was scared to death, but I passed. But you saw your way through. I saw my, very good, you get an extra piece of cake. <laughs> so, the Lord says to Samuel, you're grieving over Saul, but there's a time to grieve and there's a time to move on. And this is the time for you to move on from grieving over Saul. I'm done with Saul. It's time now to move on to the neighbor of Saul's who is better. We're going to find out who that is. So Jesse travels from Ramah to Bethlehem, which is about 10 miles, so about up to Bright and back. And we see already how things have changed because already he's scared of Saul. He's afraid, Lord, he's gonna kill me. So Saul is already apparently got his spies watching, where is Samuel going to go so we can get rid of this new king? And apparently that word has already gotten out because when Saul, or Samuel, excuse me, comes into Bethlehem, the elders of the town are afraid. Are you coming to make trouble? No, I come in peace. I'm coming to lead a sacrifice, a worship time. It's a cover story, it's the truth, it's not the whole truth, but apparently God's okay with that because that's what God tells him to say. Tell the truth, you don't necessarily have to tell the whole truth, you're not deposed in court, you know, it's not the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. But uh, that's the, the cover story that God sends with Samuel as he goes to Bethlehem. This paranoia is only going to get worse as we go on. So he sends them to the house of Jesse in Bethlehem. And that's the same Bethlehem where Rachel is buried. Rachel's tomb is outside Bethlehem. That's the same Bethlehem that Joseph and Mary traveled to, which by then is called the city of David, where Jesus is born. You can still go see it today. It's four miles from Jerusalem. Not far at all. And, uh, but at this point, Jesse and his, Jesse is clearly one of the leading citizens of Bethlehem. He is known, and he has eight sons, and clearly some wealth, because he has flocks. So it's not that they're scraping by, and they have a couple animals here and there. He's got enough flocks that they need to be cared for. So, Jesse uh, consecrates, Je uh, Samuel consecrates Jesse and his sons for the sacrifice. That would have involved, they would have taken a bath. They would have washed their clothes and put on clean clothes and gotten themselves ready for this religious feast. And as this is happening, Samuel is observing the different sons of Jesse. And the eldest, named Eliab, clearly was a tall, good-looking man. Samuel looked upon him, surely this is the next king. 
he looks kingly, you know. Go home and Google the image of King Felipe VI, the current king of Spain. He's six foot six, tall, good looking. You look at him and you say, he looks like the king, you know. He, he, he's, it just, you look, yes, that, that's what a king is supposed to look like. It was always funny when he stood next to Queen Elizabeth when she would visit, you know, she was five foot four. So, uh, you know, Samuel looks at here, this, clearly this is the guy that the Lord has sent for me to anoint, but God says to him, no, do not look on his appearance, do not look on the height of his stature, I have rejected him. Here's the big message. Praise God for this. The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance. The Lord looks on the heart. Now that's Who, for a pillow. That's, that's for a pillow, for yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who here is relieved by that? That's me. Not much to look at. So we have here, you know, a rejection. Even, even today, isn't it? The Kardashian culture. Oh, no. You know, where people are famous for being famous because they're pretty, because they're beautiful. Don't have two brain cells to rub together. <laughs> Don't have any wisdom to teach anybody. Don't have morals to lead anybody toward a better way to live or a better way to life. But everybody wants to be them, right? Because they're beautiful and curvaceous and they have nice hair and nice makeup and they are well airbrushed in their pictures. All the flaws are removed, right? But that's not how God looks on us. Praise the Lord. He looks on our hearts, which means that's what we need to tend to, right? So that money you've set aside for the facelift, or the hair plugs, or the liposuction, or the Botox, or whatever, maybe invest that more in your heart instead, and you're learning the word of the Lord and, and, and the practice of the faith and, and things like that that are worthwhile. So all the other sons, we are get the names of the next two, Abinadab and Shammah, they also passed before Jesse, and not one of the first seven are the ones that God has chosen. And Jesse, or, uh, Samuel starts scratching his head like, God told me a son of Jesse is going to be the next king. I've looked at these seven. It's not in You got any more sons around here? You know, did you misplace one? Is there one hiding in the closet under the bed somewhere? And Jesse's like, well, there is another one, but... You know, there's the runt of the litter. But I didn't even think he was important enough to invite to this. He's out taking care of the sheep. And, the, you know, that's all he's good for. And as soon as they call David, the youngest, I would guess he's probably a teenager. He's old enough to be considered an adult to go out and take care of the flocks. But he's not probably any older than that. Yeah. To have an older brother who's still a son and not off on his own. Yeah. So the eighth child. And while the Lord does not look on his appearance, we are nonetheless told. He's handsome, he's ruddy, which either means red-faced or red-haired. So he's, he's got red on him somewhere, and I know Lisa likes that. We got a ginger, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it could be, yeah, red, because he's out all day, yeah. Um, but it could mean either, he has beautiful eyes, and his father literally describes him as the smallest. It's translated here, youngest. 
and it could mean youngest, or it could mean all the other sons are tall, and then there's David. Maybe he's not full grown yet. Yeah, exactly. He's maybe not full grown, or maybe he's just the runt, <laughs> the shrimp. A commentary that he was a teenager and probably under five foot four, and this is how I came up with your nickname. When you call me Shorty, no. right? <laughs> so I assume you were calling him Shorty, and so then in the next seven, chapter seventeen, you will find Goliath. <laughs> he doesn't have. I'm not as tall as Goliath. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Can we step back? Who is Jesse? I mean, why has he become important? Really, all we know of Jesse is he is David's father. And he's a man of some standing in, in, the next in Bethlehem. So did Samuel know him before he got there? Maybe. Is there a tree in Jesse? We do a Jesse tree in Advent. Yeah. Is that any relation? Or? It's named for this because mm -hmm. from Jesse comes David, from oh, David okay. comes the Messiah. All right, gotcha. um, <coughs> Meaning family tree. Family tree, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and a Jesse tree is usually bare and only has Old Maybe Testament yes. symbols yeah. on it. Okay. I knew there was but there. Jesse is not the important one. Well, except that it seems like he knows who to go to. The Lord told him to. Told him well, to. I mean, yeah, could identify who he was. Well, he comes in and, and talks to the elders. He could have said, "Which way to Jesse's house?" Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Do you know which tribe he's from, from Jesse? Jesse? Judah. Thank you to him to look for Tribe of Judah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, he's I mean, important it's, to the Lord. I'm sorry. He was important to the Lord. Because sure. He sure. Sent him to him. Right. Um, and, and, you know, we, if you go to the end of Ruth, you get the family tree and, yep, you know, yep. Boaz, Obed, Jesse, David. But after this, you don't really hear anything else about Jesse. Well, it was my grandfather. And he was a character on the Dukes of Hazard. <laughs> but, yeah. And Full House. So... So yeah, so finally, David, uh, reining it back in here, David is uh, the one, and right there, in front of God and everybody, Samuel pulls out his cruise of oil and anoints him. In front of his brothers, in front of everyone else who's there, this is the one that God has chosen to be the next king. And the Spirit of the Lord rushes upon David, here's an important detail, from that day forward. And then Samuel left. Now, because the people are always what interests me the most, I love to put myself in different people's situation. I'd love to be one of the brothers standing there like, the shrimp? <laughs> What am I, chopped liver? You know? Were they pleased for him? Were they jealous? Were they all of that at the same time? I mean, I what was Jesse thinking? Yeah. What was Jesse thinking in all of this? I'm going to be the father of the king. You know? I have all kinds of thoughts, but we're not told. The baby wins again. The God always chooses the one that nobody else would choose. I wonder how old David was at that time. God always chooses the ones of the underdog. <coughs> so, I'm sorry, well, real quick, we'll finish this up here. So, we've got then one more contrast. The Spirit of the Lord rushes upon David, and the Spirit of the Lord leaves Saul. Hmm. And a harmful spirit, a demon of some kind, comes and begins to oppress Saul. Again, when you turn away from the Lord and refuse to repent and turn back, you will get farther and farther and farther away. We will get to the end 
right before Saul dies, he will hit his lowest when he goes and hires a witch to call up the spirit of Samuel to speak to him. So this is the downward spiral that we're going to follow here in Saul's um, trajectory here. And there are not just physical consequences here. There are spiritual and emotional consequences. This demonic spirit torments Saul and causes mental illness in him. Um, we're not told exactly how he is tormented. As we read later, we will find that Saul becomes extraordinarily paranoid. We'll see that he becomes subject to fits of rage. If you happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, he just might throw his spear at you, and you'd better be able to duck. Wouldn't you want to serve in the court of King Saul? Hope the benefits are good, because the work environment is a little oppressive. You might call that harassment. You might want to write up a report. He becomes violent and extremely mentally unstable, which is a wonderful combination to have as king, right? Let's put an emotionally unstable guy in charge. As he continues to disobey the Lord, this is what happens. So the counselors devise a treatment. We know what he needs, a little music therapy. That'll work. Actually, you know, it does. There's a lot of research into that. At least for the moment, it yeah, for a little bit. It, it's better than nothing. It was a band-aid. So they start looking for a court musician who can soothe the king with his good playing. And somebody, coincidentally, just happens to say, well, I know this guy in Bethlehem named Jesse. He's got a son who's really good at playing the lyre. Well, as we know, David went on to write half the Psalms. So he's quite an accomplished poet and musician. Maybe some of those Psalms were first played to calm down nasty old King Saul. We just but don't know. But he was in danger then. Yes, he was. Did David know that though? Probably. Yeah. The Lord certainly. He probably, you know, you're so going to go and chess. calm the king down with your musical playing and make sure you do it right or he might kill you. Yeah, I mean, the Lord certainly yeah. would have So here's one of the questions where next week we're going to look at chapter 17. Probably chapter 17 happened between the first story and chapter 16 and the second story. Because David is described here not only as a skillful player, but a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, a man of good presence, the Lord is with him. We haven't seen any of that except for the fact that he's a shepherd that knows how to play the guitar. Um, hold on. And, and uh, next week is David and Goliath. So and David clearly is not a man of war until this. So some of these stories are probably told a little out of order but we have here David coming to court. Eventually, from this, he's, he's is beloved, we're told, by Saul initially. He's going to become a general in the army. He's going to become the king's son-in-law. And then, he, as his armor bearer here, he's in an incredibly important position, proximity to the king. He, can, he has the king's ear, which meant he's powerful. But we have Saul still as king when he should be, and David next to him who should be superior to him in spirit, waiting in the wings, and eventually Saul's going to get jealous, and things aren't going to go well. So initially he's, he did love him. Initially, yeah. David was a lovable guy. A lot of people loved David. David loved even a though, lot of people. Even though he knew that was <laughs> Even though what? Even though he, he was anointed by God to be the next Saul king. probably didn't know that at first. I thought Saul was sent away. And... Oh, he continues to be king even though he's rejected. Oh, okay. He knows he's rejected, but he doesn't step down. Oh, I get it. 
that was what kind of I was aiming at is that all this time David knows he's been anointed, but this is not the publicized as far as. Not yet. It will become known. Right. So and how much time transpired between when he's anointed and when he becomes king? Uh, That's what I wondered though, too. Uh, it, so I don't know that it, I have to go back and look exactly. Decades. Yeah. It, it's a long time that Saul refuses to step down. So he's an older man when he takes the throne then? Yes. Um, I have that for next week. So he's probably near 40. Yeah, I mean, he is old enough to be David's grandfather. Oh, maybe older. Yeah. Well, they had kids younger then. But, yeah. So chapter 17 really should be before chapter 16. Well, it probably should happen in the middle there. Yeah. Um, FYI, next week we're only going to look at chapter 17. It's far too long. Yeah, I will be, I'm sorry to disappoint okay. you, but yes, I will be here next week. Um, there's a... Uh, Why did you say that? Just teasing. Normally we try to look at two chapters, but 17 is far too long and there's far too much going on. We're just going to look at David and Goliath. In two weeks I will be gone. Oh, okay. And um, so we'll have a break on November the 14th. Um, and then we'll be back. Okay. David and Goliath happens between the first story in chapter 16 and the second story. So, so basically, this is kind of backwards because I'm sitting here thinking he was out feeding the flocks when Goliath did that. Well, because next chapter, when we look at David and Goliath, Saul isn't going to know who he is. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So he gets then reintroduced later when he's going to say. So they're just trying to get Yes. They did this just so this will confuse Rita. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, All right, I'm sorry that I have kept you late again, but uh, be sure to go and get seconds of uh, goodies and treats. I'm sorry, who was? Can we get an update on Judy? Uh, Judy's surgery went well. She is home, sleeping, and Nurse Jeff is watching over her. Uh, please keep her in your prayers. The next couple days are going to be the toughest days after surgery. Uh, so pray that things go well. So let's close with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for all your guidance. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you, Lord, for being faithful to your promises and to your covenant, even when your people were not faithful to you. Lord, we pray that you would help us to continue as we study your word to understand what you have left for us here, to receive all that you would give to us, and to put these lessons into practice in our own lives. Go with us now as we return to our homes and help us to be a blessing to others this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys, and happy Reformation Day.